Morning Park Church, let's stand together. Shall we?
praise you this morning, God. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up, I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. Let's sing that again. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up, I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful, and all my life you have been so, so the goodness of God. I love your voice. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night. You were close like no other. I've known you as a father. I've known you as a friend. And I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the good.
shall sing of the goodness. Let's sing it again. goodness is never failing. It's always there. Thank you, God, that you are good and uh, you're running after us. We trust you. Thank you. We love you. And uh, we're so thankful that we get to enter into your word today. We get to study your word. So we pray that you would be with us this morning. In the name of Jesus, everybody said, amen. Uh, so, so glad that you're here. You can take a seat. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Pastor John. I am the Youth and Young Adults Pastor here. And uh, for those of you who are new and you're joining with us, we're so glad that you're here. Uh, we would love to connect with you and get to know a little bit more about you. We would also love to share the opportunity, whoa. <laughs> we would love to share uh, just a little bit about what we're doing as well. And so uh, if you are new, you can text the number 587-600-1905 uh, or you can fill out the card in front of you and put it in one of those boxes where we put the offering in the back of the auditorium. Uh, we would, again, just love to get to connect with you um, as well. This morning, it's a long weekend. Happy long weekend. Thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, I know it's kind of a bummer. It's a little smoky on this very, very hot. Who wore shorts this morning? I was preaching, so I'm not allowed to wear shorts, but I really wanted to. <laughs> 34 degrees is hot. Um, but we have uh, popsicles to cool you down after the service. So stick around. We're going to have popsicle Sunday, hanging out, connecting with some people that you may not have, may not have connected with in the past little bit. And uh, yeah, if nothing else, grab a popsicle and then run to your car, into your air-conditioned car, because it's going to be very hot. Uh, in a minute. We're going to dive into the Word of God. I'm really excited to share the Word of God with you this morning. But before we do that, I want to take a second and pray because we still have some needs in our church. There's some people in our congregation who need a touch from God. And so why don't you join with me as we pray a little bit of an update real quick before we do. Last week we had reported that Brenda Thompson was not doing well in the hospital. She has since started her recovery. She's going to be moving to the Glen Rose or Glen Allen. Yeah. God is good. God is good. But we still do need to be praying for her because her recovery, uh, there's going to be a lot of work to do in that recovery. As well, as for Ron, he is, uh, he is tired and he's been with his wife in the hospital as much as he could. But he's also struggling with his own health issues. So uh, if you can, just pray with me along with a few other needs. So. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you are God and you are good. Thank you that you are always faithful. We're going to be talking about that today. But God, we also just trust and know that you are God, you are good, you are the one that heals. And so God, we lift up Pastor Colin and Susie as they are still recovering from COVID. We pray that you would heal their bodies. God, we pray for Renda, uh, Brenda Thompson that you would heal her body. And uh, Lord God, we pray for Dan Small and any other needs in our church. We also, Lord, pray for Shiloh Youth Camp. That's our mission's emphasis this month. And uh, God, thank you for all that they're doing during the summer. Thank you for the at-risk youth that they're reaching. We just pray that you would be with them in their ministry and that you would do amazing work in the lives of the kids that they are ministering to. We praise you and thank you for everything and keep us safe in this really hot, day. In the name of Jesus, everybody said? Amen. amen. Well, thanks again. Yeah, amen. Good job, buddy. Uh, so, if you have been following the last four weeks, we have been talking uh, about 
a topic called the giants in our lives or facing giants. Now, Pastor Joe kicked us off with talking about facing giants and how the Israelites, they faced so many giants all at once right as soon as they left their captivity in Egypt. They faced this wall of water, the the Red Sea that they couldn't cross. They faced a giant army of Egyptian people coming to get them because they changed their mind, I guess. Uh, And they also faced just fear and worry. They had a moment of, God, you brought us all this way just to kill us. I don't understand. They, They had this giant in their lives, surrounded by giants. We also talked about the giant of culture and conformity and how it is so hard sometimes for us to stand up against our culture. And so we we talked about that. And then last week, Pastor Shea talked about the giant of intimidation, where we, when we are faced with fear, something bigger than we know what to do with, God is faithful. We're talking this month, intimidations, things that are immovable obstacles, but we know we have immeasurable, incredible God. Amen? So this morning, uh, I want to continue this series, and I want to talk to you today about a giant in our lives that I think we all face, especially this past year. COVID has been nothing but a giant of intimidation, uh, a, a giant of fear, but it also has been a giant of discouragement. And I think a lot of us in this room can agree that Almost on a weekly basis, there's some type of discouragement that we face in our lives. But this year, we're just going to we're just going to say it. This year has been a discouraging year. A lot of people have faced different types of physical, emotional, and spiritual discouragement, feeling like instead of gaining ground in their lives, they're actually going backwards. And I don't know about you, maybe you're sitting here like, actually, I'm feeling the most encouraged I've ever been. COVID was great for me. I I think you probably need to go get checked by a doctor. If that's the case, uh, this year was discouraging. And so we all are freshly aware of the fact that we need God to help us when we face this giant of discouragement. And so today, I want to dive in that with you. We have a lot of ground to cover in the Bible because uh, something that I like to do with our youth is... I grew up as a pastor's kid who heard on a micro level a lot of details about a lot of stories of the Bible. Um, I don't know about you, anybody here under 30 or have kids that are under 30 that picture most of the Bible stories like they're veggie tales? Anybody? (laughs) Most of my theology, I'm pretty sure, has somewhat come from those movies because as a kid, I heard these stories. I was well-versed in a lot of the normal, big stories in the Bible, but and that's actually really great. I'm very, very thankful for the way that I was raised, but there are moments where I look at the Bible and I go, wait, that connects? That is the same person? (laughs) There's There's a video, it's like, wait, baby Jesus and a regular Jesus, that's the same guy? Like, I have these moments in my Christian walk where I'm reading through the Bible going, hang on a second, I didn't realize how close together those stories were. And oftentimes, if we, if we look in the micro uh, stories of the Bible, we can see incredible detail that apply to our lives, but if we can take a step back and a bird's eye view, a macro level of the Bible, we can see God's overarching character and plan for our lives. And so today, we're going to cover a lot of ground. I'm not going to read the whole thing because you don't want to hear me ramble and stumble over words as I try and read a ton of scripture. But we are going to be talking about some key points in three different books this morning. We're going to be going through Numbers, Deuteronomy, and a little bit of Joshua because I want to get a macro view of what God was doing with the Israelites. In fact, we're building off of what Pastor Joe had just talked about. Because uh, in the first sermon that he preached in this series, he talked about that Red Sea and how the Red Sea was split and the Israelites walked along the, the dry ground, that land bridge that Pastor Joe was talking about. Um, but as we engage in this, just know that we're, we're covering a lot of ground. I hope you can stick with me. But remember that God wants to help you slay these giants in your life. And specifically this morning, he wants to help you slay the giant of discouragement. So Joshua 1, 7 and 9. 
we're going to get right into it. This is what God was saying to Joshua after he's taken over for Moses. He's entering into the promised land that they have been waiting for a very long time to enter. They're about to cross the Jordan River. They're about to go and take over the city of Jerusalem, which is the fir- or, sorry, of Jericho, which is the first city that they need to overcome to start taking the promised land into their own possession. So this is what God says as Joshua is leading the army. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law that my servant Moses has given you. Do not turn from it, from the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. And this is what I want you to take away from this morning. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. I think Rick Warren had pointed out that somewhere, somewhere along the lines of 200 times, the Bible says, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. It's easy to say, even if you don't get anything else from me this morning, the word of God is here, it's clear, we know that God's word is true, this is it. You can, you can turn off now, you don't need to listen to anything more. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you, wherever you go. So, let's take a second and pray, and then we'll get into it. Heavenly Father, thank you so, so, so much that you were with us. You were with Joshua as he led the army. You were with the Israelites as they followed you, and we are grafted into that. We are saved by grace through the redemption that comes through Jesus Christ, and now we get to hold the promises that you have given the Israelite community. This is not just for the people back then. This is for us, and so thank you, God, for this promise that you gave Joshua. Thank you that we can hold on to it today. Help us to be strong and courageous. Help us not to be afraid, and help us not to be discouraged even when we face these massive giants that we don't know what to do with. We praise your name. A men. So I'm going to ask you again, have you ever felt discouraged? Well, (laughs) thank you. Yeah, I have. So if you have made it, again, this past year, you're crazy if you're not discouraged. And so I want to talk about um, some aspects of, of ways that we become discouraged. Physically, it's really easy to become discouraged if our bodies just give up on us. I'm 25 and, uh, I thought that I was going to live forever because, you know, I'm 25 and I'm invincible. And then I had a kid and I started gaining a little bit of weight. And my life started to slow, speed up at home and slow down here. And and now I'm like, man, my hamstrings hurt. In fact, I was playing softball and I pulled my hamstring. Actually, I tore my hamstring like I'm in my middle age already. I'm scared about what's coming down the pipe. But physically, you can get discouraged when your health just gives out on you. Financially, you can get discouraged when you're just trying to keep your head above water. You got a plan to get out of debt and then all of a sudden your car breaks down and you got another payment to make or another bill that you were not expecting. Spiritually, I find a lot of people are in the same situation constantly where they are doing everything that they're supposed to do. They're reading their Bible, they're praying, but they just don't seem like they're making any ground in their spiritual walk. It feels like this last year, they did nothing. We, we just sat at home, but for some reason, instead of getting closer to God, it felt like we went backwards. And we were faced with these giants of discouragement in our lives. As we're opening up and and gaining a little bit of ground here with COVID, we're finally, um, you know, opening up, kind of getting back to normal. It's funny, a lot of people are asking the question, where is my motivation? Where did it go? I was so upset that everything shut down, but now that it's opening up, I'm having a really tough time getting back to the way that it used to be. My stamina is not quite there anymore. Am I, I'm questioning why we do certain things. I know we've been talking in a, in a long series, uh, do you even care at youth? Because I think it's really important to address the question, where's your motivation? Why do we do what we do? And coming out of COVID, it's a really good time to reexamine, why are we doing what we're doing? 
And so a lot of people are finding themselves professionally discouraged. They're discouraged in their, their job, whether they are feeling like they were supposed to get a promotion and then they got a layoff, or, or socially, uh, I'm, I'm a high-level extrovert. Every time I take a test, and I remember when Pastor Colin made the whole staff do a personality test, we, uh, we, we took it and we handed in our scores and Pastor Colin looked at me and he was like, I don't think that I've ever met somebody with as high of a score in the extroverted scale as you. I was like, oh, well, I just love people, I guess. And even me, I'm finding it difficult after being locked in my house for a year to find the energy, the enthusiasm, the 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 motivation to go back to the way things were and to get into large groups of people and to carry large conversations, which used to give me life. And now I'm like, man, Beth, you're such an introvert. You're rubbing off on me. Like, I don't like this. (laughs) I'm becoming a bit more of a hermit. But it's no secret that a huge byproduct of this past pandemic has been mental health. Statistically speaking, a large number of you in this room are dealing with uh, a significant percentage of mental health. A lot of people here today are struggling with mental health. And it might not be you, but I I bet you, you could be in the vicinity of somebody who is dealing very uh, strongly with a mental health issue. And COVID-19 did not help that in any way. People are feeling discouraged. I mean, the news is really never, ever, ever that good, right? The news sells bad news. That's what gets our attention. But lately, it just feels like there have been nothing good coming our way. It it just feels like every time I watch the news or I hear somebody, hey, did you hear? There's this instant reaction of like, I'm bracing myself for what's about to happen. Dr. Hinshaw, uh, I think it was on Thursday, she made an address. And when Colton told me that Dr. Hinshaw was making an address, my heart sank. And I got a, a knot in my throat. I was like, oh, Lord, please, not again. I got discouraged. There's this, this bracing ourselves for the news because this news has been hitting home and it's been relentless this past year. It's funny, the news was actually good. We actually opened up more. Uh, our cases were down. Everything's, we're... It's good news, but I was worried because we, I'm not used to it. And I don't know about you, but I, I want to get back to being used to good news, but I'm faced with this giant of discouragement. And so today, I want to encourage you, we have good news. God is good. The Bible is God's word, and therefore everything in here is good news. And so, Amen. God's word is good. So you can lean in a little bit this morning. You can relax. You don't have to brace yourself. I have good news for you this morning. And God wants to help you slay these giants of discouragement. So I want to ask the question, what is discouragement? What does discouragement actually mean? Well, the definition of discouragement is a loss of confidence or enthusiasm. Who here can agree that they have lost confidence and enthusiasm over this past year? Anybody? In some way or another, it doesn't have to be generally speaking, but in any specific situation, when you lose your confidence in something or you lose your enthusiasm towards something, you become discouraged towards that thing. But how does this happen? How do we lose our confidence and our enthusiasm? Well, I believe that there are three main ways that we can become discouraged in our lives. The first one is that our expectation is not met. Whenever we're, we're, we have some expectation, whether it's reasonable or unreasonable, when our expectations are not met, it's easy to become discouraged. We expect something to go some way, but it never does seem to go like that or it it feels like it could never get that way. Our expectations are not met or it feels like they couldn't be met. The second way that we can become discouraged is waiting too long for something. I am discouraged when I get on the Hende and realize it's going to take me 45 minutes to drive 15 minutes home. It's it's discouraging when I know that my, my life is now being held up by everybody else in the city. I know it's so selfish, but I can get discouraged in that respect. But maybe you're waiting for someone someone to act on something. 
or you're waiting to see a doctor, or you're waiting for a callback for a job, or you're waiting for God to do something in your life, that period of waiting can become very discouraging. And the third way I think we can become discouraged is repeated disappointment. Maybe it's not waiting for something, but something keeps happening that is different from what you expected and it disappointed you. There is a huge letdown or constant little letdowns that build up. You're continually faced with disappointment after disappointment in any given situation. And when that happens, you can very easily become discouraged. Now, when we're faced with disappointment, it's really easy to let that fester and grow. Uh, Disappointment can quickly become discouragement. And when discouragement is fully embraced, it gives birth to defeat. It's funny, there's a few verses in the Bible that actually, it almost parallels this in in a way, where it says, you know, Perseverance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not return void because God is good. And, and that's in Romans 5, I think. But, but it's funny, in the opposite way, just like perseverance produces character and character produces hope, in the opposite way, disappointment, if we don't take care of that disappointment, if we don't handle that disappointment well, it turns into discouragement rather than character. And then that discouragement when we hold on to it and we let it fester, it turns into defeat. Disappointment is saying something didn't go the way that I wanted it to go, but discouragement is saying that I don't think that it will ever go the way that I want it to go. I don't think that that promise will ever be fulfilled. I don't think that this is even possible at this point. Discouragement is just a buildup and an embracement of a disappointment. And when we do that and when we hold on to it, it can defeat us. I give up. This is ridiculous. I'm done waiting for them to get their act together. This will never work. I'm out. It's better just for me to cut my losses at this point. Does God even hear my prayers when I pray? All of these things are said in moments of discouragement or disappointment. It's funny, I don't blame anybody for feeling that way because when I played any type of sports, all of my coaches said something along the same lines. Every single one of them said, whatever work you put in, you will eventually produce something in your life. Whatever you put into practice, you will then see benefits in the game. So when I was playing rugby, we would practice this this move. It was called a switch. And the inside center would switch the ball with the outside center. It would confuse the team, and then they would throw it out to me, the small, scared winger who's afraid of getting tackled because I was 115 pounds, and those guys were 220. So I was afraid, and we would practice this drill over and over and over and over again. And the first try, the first goal that I ever made in rugby was because we practiced this over and over, and I saw the results in the game. But in life that doesn't always work that way. It's good to think that way. It's good to say, well, I'm going to put in effort. I'm going to do my due diligence. This is what I'm supposed to do because otherwise you're never going to see anything. But sometimes we put in work and we expect that the same rule should apply always and forever. If I work this hard at my job, I should get a promotion. If I do join a small group, the church probably won't shut down because of a pandemic and I'll be able to grow with my church community. If I read my Bible, I'll always be able to hear from God because I'm putting in the work. But sometimes in our lives, that just doesn't happen. We put in this effort. We expect other people to put in the same amount of effort, but for some reason, life just throws us these moments of disappointment and discouragement. And we have to be careful with how we handle these expectations that aren't being met. It's funny, sometimes this can even happen when we're trusting in God for promises, like praying for a loved one that just isn't saved yet. We've been praying and praying and praying, but the disappointment of them not turning to Jesus can be a discouragement and almost lead to our defeat. Raising your kids at times, and I'm, <laughs> I'm worried, Theo's one, and I'm starting to learn. I'm trying to teach him to do certain things, but sometimes he just doesn't listen. 
Sometimes our bedtime routine is perfect and flawless, and we do everything that Kara from Taking Care of Babies told us in our class, but he doesn't go to sleep. It's funny, but we put in the effort, and we're faced with this discouragement until midnight with a crying baby who just won't leave us alone. <laughs> He's not here, so I'm not hurting his feelings. It's okay. <laughs> It's funny, but the Israelites felt very similar to this. Remember what I had said. Pastor Joe had talked about this, but when they left Egypt, they were freed from Egypt. God did this, in, this incredible miracle. He, he put plagues on the Egyptians. God, they saw God's sovereignty and his hand moving. Who could deny God's, uh, God's faithfulness in that moment? But when they faced the Red Sea, they had no idea how they were going to cross it. They turned around and realized Egypt changed their mind, and they got discouraged. So much so that they embraced it and almost let it defeat them, yelling out to God, God, why? They treated him with contempt, the Bible says. Why have you brought us here just to die? Even though they saw what God did before, they embraced their discouragement now and it almost led to their defeat. But God was faithful. He split the Red Sea and they crossed. Then 40 years in the desert, they're wandering. For 40 years, it could have taken them, I can't remember how long, but I think it was like something crazy like a month or two. They could have made it to the promised land, but 40 years they were wandering around in this desert because God was testing them because they kept getting discouraged. The Bible says that God, they, they treated God with contempt 10 times while in the desert and God had to test them. It led to their defeat because they didn't trust God even though he had been faithful over and over and over and over again. So the Israelites are now at the promised land after the 40 years. They're at the Jordan River, and on the other side of the Jordan River, geographically, is now the promised land. This is the area where they are supposed to take over. God has finally brought them there. They can see it on the other side. Moses then goes, okay, we got to remember veggie tales, the land flowing with milk and honey. Uh, Moses said, okay, we're going to go, I'm going to send one spy from each one of the tribes of Israel, they're going to go out and they're going to survey the land and they're going to come back and report. I want to make sure that this is it. So the spies go out and they come back with this amazing report saying, hey, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's flowing with milk and honey. You should see what's growing in the ground. This is a beautiful country. This is what we've been waiting for for the 40 years. This is so exciting. Now, I should mention this, that two of those spies, one is named Joshua, which we just read about before. And one of them is named Caleb. And they're very crucial to this story. This is going to come into play two books later, but we need to know this. Those two people you need to keep an eye on because they are the people that we want to live like. They go in and check the land. They say, yes, it's flowing with milk and honey, but they come back and also report that they have seen literal giants in the land. Literal giants. You remember last week, Pastor Shea was talking about Goliath and how he was nine foot something? Well, he was what scholars believe a descendant of Anak or the Nephilim, which we hear about in Genesis. They were giant people. Yeah, he, he was nine foot something. And this is nation filled with giant, giant people. And the Israelites, especially the spies, they got discouraged in that moment. They started spreading around this discouragement. And I'm actually going to read this for you in Numbers 13, 27 to 33. It says this, We went into the land which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here's the fruit. But the people who are living there are powerful. The cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The, okay, and then he just lists off a bunch of people uh, a bunch of cities that I'm probably going to mispronounce, so we're going to skip over that. <laughs> then Caleb, this is crucial. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. Caleb remembered what God had done those past ten times or nine times when God was faithful over and over and over again. And he was like, giants what? God split the Red Sea, guys. Let's go do it. Let's fight. He's all excited. And these other men, it says, but 
the men who had gone up with him said, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they, sp- they spread among the Israelites a bad report. They used their testimony of discouragement to spread a bad report about the land that they have explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. And all the people we saw are of great size. We saw the Nephilim, the descendants of Anak. They are coming from Nephilim. Uh, from from the Nephilim. We see we seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes and we definitely look like that to them. They're they're explaining they're literally getting discouraged by a literal giant. I wasn't gonna preach on this, but I felt like it kind of fit the story that we're saying this month. They're facing a city, a nation of giants, and they get too afraid. And then it says that the people rebelled against God. And they treated him with contempt and refused to go. They started to discourage one another, proclaiming that they could never fight these giants and win. The news disappointed them so much that they started to question why God would ever bring them this far just for them to lose. Kind of sounds familiar. This seems to be a theme with the Israelite people. And I feel like it might be a theme in my life and your life as well. But God got so angry at this point. This was number 10. This was strike 10. And this is what happens. God tells Moses he's going to wipe out the Israelites. And Moses pleads, like, God, you promised. You promised that you would take the Israelites, the descendants of Abraham, into the promised land. Please, don't wipe us out here now. And God says this, in Numbers 14, 20 to 23, the Lord replied, I have forgiven them as you ask. Nevertheless, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills the whole earth, not one of those who saw my glory and signs I performed in Egypt in the wilderness, but who disobeyed me 10 times, not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to, to my servant, or sorry, to my ancestors. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. But because my servant Caleb was different, and get this, this is crucial, but because my servant Caleb was different, had a different spirit and followed me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he went to and his descendants will inherit it. God got so frustrated with the Israelites that he allowed their discouragement finally to defeat them. This generation of Israelites got so disappointed because it didn't go the way that they thought it was going to go. They thought God was just going to take them right there on an express train and they were going to walk in. Nobody was going to be there. They weren't going to have to fight. It was going to be easy. But instead, they were faced with these disappointments and these unexpected things. Their expectations were not met and so they got discouraged. And then, when they were discouraged, they fully embraced that. They spread it around the community, and it gave birth to their defeat. So much so, that God had to wait, let them wait on the other side of the Jordan for 38 more years. The book of Deuteronomy is them just sitting there waiting for everybody to die off. Because they were defeated. They wouldn't, what's crazy is that they they said, no, it's never going to happen. And so God was like, okay, you don't get to go. And then they went, oh, wait, no, 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 we're good, we're good, we're good. And so a bunch of Israelites actually went and tried to fight some of these giants and they lost because God's hand was off at that point. Their discouragement had already led to their defeat. And so in this season, they waited and then this new crop of Israelites, these people under 20 who weren't there for the Red Sea, they graduated, they, they grew up 38 years later. I guess it's enough time to grow. I'm not even that old. That's a long time. Finally, Moses dies. He wasn't even, he was allowed to see the promised land, but he didn't even get to go across. And Moses had to hand over that authority to Joshua, who then led the Israelites, and for that moment anyway, later on in history, they'll, they'll blow it again. But for right now, these Israelites were the complete opposite of the other Israelites. They were confident. They were willing to trust God. 
they were willing to say, God has been faithful in the past. God will be faithful in the future. So now we pick up a full book later after Numbers. Deuteronomy has happened. They've waited 38 years. And now we are entering into Joshua, which we just read at the beginning. Be strong and very courageous. Take heart. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord your God is with you. And so now Joshua is leading this army. He crosses over the Jordan River, which is a parallel to what just happened at the Red Sea some almost, I'm bad at math, 70-something 70, 70 years ago, 78 years ago. God split the Red Sea. God does the same thing in the Jordan River and lets the Israelites cross. It's almost like an amazing picture of, hey, I'm faithful. I'll do this all over again if you just follow me. That's a word for you this morning. God is faithful. And so they cross over the Jordan and they're on their way to walk around the walls of Jericho for seven straight days. I don't know about you, but that takes some faith and uh, some willingness to face the giant of discouragement. Could you imagine walking? I, I'm just going to, I'm, I'm going to assume that a lot of people have heard the story of Jericho because even in our culture, we use the walls of Jericho as kind of a, a cliche phrase, even outside of biblical communities. But the story of Jericho is they literally just walked around the city seven times. This is a massive city. They had sent spies in. God had proven to them that he was going to take this city over for them. They were afraid. The Israelites walked with confidence around the city seven times. It's not even like during that seven times, a little few bricks fell out just to give them reassurance. Nothing happened. They were blowing trumpets. They went home and slept. They came back. They walked around the city again. On the seventh day, they walked around seven times and then they yelled. And then the walls came down and God gave them the promised land. What's crazy is that the Israelites in that moment, they had to yell before the walls would knock down. And what's interesting is, is that's a huge parallel. Their discouragement was spread among the people. The, their voice, the words that they used, they proclaimed their discouragement and they were defeated. But when they proclaimed God's goodness, even in the face of a massive stone wall that has no business falling down, they were willing to proclaim that God's good in that moment and the walls fell down. And sometimes we need to proclaim God's goodness before our walls come down. Sometimes we have to walk in a circle for seven days when it doesn't make any sense and the people around us are making fun of us. It doesn't seem to make any logical sense, but God is faithful and he will do what he's gonna do if we just trust him. And so, I say it again, do not be afraid, be strong and courageous. So I want to ask, what do we do in our own lives when we're faced with the giant of discouragement? Well, the first thing is, and Joe, Pastor Joe would be so proud because we have some good alliteration this morning. Uh, the first thing that you need to do is block out the haters. You need to block out the people that are spreading their discouragement because the truth is discouragement is contagious. It is so, so, so easy to have a conversation with somebody when they're going, oh my goodness, can you, did you hear about this? This is ridiculous. I'm so, oh, I just want to give up. And you're like, yeah, me too. I'm tired. It's really easy to lean into that. It's contagious. But the first thing that we need to do when we are faced with the giant of discouragement, when we are faced with a lack of enthusiasm and a loss of confidence, we need to block out the people who are talking bad about that situation because we need to stay focused. And the second thing is we need to believe that God's promises are true. In Deuteronomy, so in that middle stage, right before uh, Joshua led the army, God gives him this word that he holds to wholeheartedly. And actually the Israelites implement this to now the Jewish people still do this today. But Deuteronomy eleven nineteen to 20 says, Fix these words of mine on your heart and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your forehead. Teach them to your children, talking, to them, or talking about them when you sit down and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates, so that you, the days of you and your children may be many in the land of the Lord swore to your ancestors. 
as many as the days are in heaven are above the earth. This is the promise that God gave Joshua right before he went to Jericho to walk along that path. He's saying, hey, remember my word. And actually today, Jewish people in their culture, it's common to write uh, a scroll or have scrolls written and, and kind of put in a little case and they put them on their door frames. And then in certain ceremonies, they actually bind them on their arms and on their foreheads as a symbol of saying, we hold to God's word wholeheartedly. And I don't know what this morning you need to find in your life to do something. You don't have to stick a box on your head if you don't want to. But I don't know what you need to do this morning to make sure that you remember that God's word is in your heart. Hold to it wholeheartedly because it is the only thing that reminds us about what God has done and what he will do in the future. And the third thing that we need to do when we are faced with discouragement is before it happens, testify in the hard times. Before it happens, testify in the valley. I'm going to get uh, Leon to come, up, come back up and just play keys. Um, but before uh, he gets up here, I, I want to I explain that I'm not sharing this for some pity or, or you know, I, I, I don't want to share this because I want anybody to sympathize. Um, if you know anything about Beth and I's recent journey with pregnancy, you'll know this story already. But I want to take a minute to lead by example in this third point. And before it happens, testify about God's goodness. And so for those of you who don't know, Beth and I have had some struggle when it comes to pregnancy. Um, We had uh, our first pregnancy about a year and a half, two years ago. Actually, it would definitely be two and a half years ago at this point. We had our first pregnancy and we we actually lost that pregnancy to a miscarriage. And that was an extremely painful and disappointing situation that we faced. That that hurt us deeply, but we were willing to try again and and we believed that God was faithful. And so we, we, we tried again and we got pregnant again. And we unfortunately lost that pregnancy faster than the first one. And so not only did that pain come back to us, and it it was extremely painful, but this disappointment started to stack on top of each other. We started to really feel like, is anything going to happen? Are we going to be stuck in this cycle? Are we going to be people that are not actually able to have kids? Are we going to have to go through this pain again if we get pregnant? And we started to get discouraged. But what's interesting is that, is that Beth, my wife, she felt very strongly that God had uh, placed on her heart that she was going to be a mother when she was little. Um, Beth has her own testimony about her walk with God, and uh, it's beautiful, and I, I love hearing her share her testimony. But part of the way that, that God spoke to her when she was young was that she was going to be a mother. And so this was a promise that she was holding on to. She knew God was going to give her a child, but we were faced with some pretty heavy disappointment. The giant of disappointment was huge. And so we got pregnant again, and that entire pregnancy, I won't lie to you, we were fearful. We were discouraged. We were trusting in God, but there was these serious moments of fear and anxiety and worry, wondering, are we going to lose this child too? But praise God, Theo was born, and we're so excited. Theo's, Theo's one now. He just turned one, and we've been celebrating every day the fact that God has given us a child. But I remember when he was born, even that first month, he had a problem with his breathing. And when he would breathe, he, his, his larynx would actually close over his airway and he was deprived of oxygen. And we were waiting for doctors to get him in for a surgery. We had to wait until he was about four months. Uh, it was a long process. It was a painful process. And through it all, we kind of felt like the Israelites standing at the Red Sea. We said, God, you took us this far. Is this where it ends? You gave us this promise, but God, is this, what, is this where you brought us to just to take it away from us again? And we were discouraged. Now, thank God, Theo is healthy. 
and he's happy and he's growing. But then recently, and I don't know how many people do know this already, but recently we tried to have another baby. And we were faced with the same problem again. This, we, we lost our third baby. We had our thir- third miscarriage. And again, it was painful. And we were faced not only with the same pain and the same discouragement, but we were also faced with the intense reality that we may have to go through this again. We were faced with this massive giant of discouragement and even now I'm standing here talking to you with a wall, a giant of discouragement in our lives. We know that God is faithful. We've seen God faithful throughout scripture. Even There's, there's even stories of people being 100 years old and having kids. I know that God is faithful. I know that we've even had a kid. God in our own life has been faithful, but right now I testify to you that we are facing a giant of discouragement, but we will not let that be our downfall and our defeat. And I want to encourage you, I only tell you this to encourage you that in your own life, whatever giants you may be facing, press in. Testify before The pain is relieved. Testify in the valley. Testify in the hard times. God is faithful. And you can always bank on his promises. It's interesting, but but, um, a man by, um, wow, a man named Rich Wilkerson, he he said, the hardest part about faith is that last 10%. Some people might be walking around their Jericho and they're feeling like, discouraged people are saying that it's not going to work they're feeling like they're saying that it's not going to work i want to encourage you that god is faithful he will never let you down and sometimes it feels foolish to just keep going but god has a plan for you be strong and very courageous for the lord your god is with you sometimes you have to walk by faith and not by sight You're going to have to walk around walls sometimes that seem foolish and frustrating and uncertain, but God is faithful. And so I I, I want to point out one more thing, and then this is it. Your testimony is extremely powerful when looking at this biblical narrative. When Joshua proclaimed God has taken the city. He led an entire nation with confidence to go and walk around a wall that made no sense. But they were willing to do it because they believed that God was faithful. But the op- when the opposite is true and you spread discouragement and worry and fear to the people around you, that can become contagious, not just for you, but for the people around you. The people in this church need to hear your testimony, whether it's happened already as a reminder of how good God is or your testimony of your faithfulness in serving God and believing that he's gonna do something in your life. God is faithful, amen? So in the face of the giant of discouragement, I encourage you to remind yourself, hold fast the words of God, block out the people that are telling you otherwise and be somebody that encourages others along the way. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we get to spend time together this morning in your word. Thank you that you are the God that helps us face our giants. You've called us to be giant slayers, like Pastor Joe said. And God, discouragement is no different. We are here asking you to give us strength and courage as we face our discouragement. Help us, Lord, to proclaim your goodness even in the tough times and knowing that you are God, you are good, your mercy endures forever. We serve you, we love you. God, thank you for the popsicles that we're about to go and have. And uh, God, thank you for this long weekend. I just pray that you would be with each and every person here or listening online, that you would bless them, that you would keep them, that you would reveal yourself, and that in the face of discouragement, we would be able to lean into you and know that you are God and you are good. In the name of Jesus, everybody said, amen. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. I will see you in the foyer. Enjoy the popsicles and enjoy your long weekend.
Thanks, everybody.